Are you recording? Uh, yes, I'm recording. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Sorry, I don't want to get the wrong way through. And then, uh, okay. Sorry. That's the way he began right. every single video with AJ. <laughs> Wait, are you re- You are. Okay. Go now. Now? Right now? <laughs> and AJ's like, I've been doing it for about 20 minutes. I got some great stuff. Oh, man. Yep. Love that. Well, Jeff, we are just so excited to have you on the podcast now. And it, it's, it's, I, was, I was thinking about introing this and saying it's so weird to say welcome to the podcast to you. It's like saying welcome to the podcast to the microphone, like you're just a fixture right, here right. at Grace Church. So, um, but we're so glad to have you here. And uh, thanks for agreeing to be on the podcast this week. Sure. Good to be here. Yeah. Never done one of these. Yeah. And uh, how have you been, have you been keeping up this past uh past season of our lives here the past quarantine yeah the past quarantine yeah (laughs) you got it uh kind of just maintaining you know trying to do what you can but it's still you know getting tired of seeing people two-dimensional so that's what's kind of hard um so when people will you do you you kind of run into people who normally it might be just a passing hey you're kind of like i'm gonna extend this because you're a real breathing person i want to talk a little bit more to you so well hopefully we can add another dimension even though you know we're not seeing each other right now but i like what you said that we're going to extend this because we just when we're thinking about the fact that you're retiring uh, at the end of the month um we just really wanted to have an extended time with you um see what you whether, there. Yeah, well, yeah there you go um to just talk about a lot of things so i don't know i feel like we have enough questions here we could talk for like an entire afternoon so maybe we'll just see what happens you know there's, there's no limit on this you know it's a podcast people can fast forward if they want you can order so, out dinner yeah but where i think but i know um i'm excited to be talking about this uh, with you today and i know aaron is too so didn't say hi to aaron yet aaron is uh, remote you're truly remotely <laughs> Yeah, I am. I'm as remote as you can get on a podcast, and uh, you're in this, in like you're like in the remote places of uh, your vacation there. Yeah, we can exactly. we can we say where you are. Yeah, it's, it's I'm not not in the witness protection program, so you're allowed okay. to, uh, to say it. no. I'm I'm out visiting Rochelle's family in uh, Wisconsin, and uh, yep, they're right in the middle of the state, as rural as you could picture, and it's as opposite from Bergen County as you can picture, which is why. Uh, one of the reasons why I love coming out here. Um, but yeah, I got a couple of days left and then I'll, I'll be coming, coming back and to keep with the theme of the podcast, Rochelle and the kids will be extending their stay <laughs> nice. out here. And, nice. um, but I, I don't know if we mentioned it, but I think, you know, one, one of, I think we would have had Jeff on, on the podcast sooner or later, regardless, but yeah. the reason why we're doing it and you can kind of firm that up and do the math as to when that started. But, Maybe that's a good way to start, Jeff. This kind of, and I know it's a big question to start, but um, kind of a little bit about your story. Uh, obviously, everybody at Grace Church knows you, but they don't know maybe how you got started in ministry or what your path has been like. Um, so maybe kind of give us a story as of you going into ministry and and, and where it led to today. Sure. Uh, well, back in 1968, I was seven years old, gave my life to Christ, and then I started youth ministry. So you know, I'm just in my mid 40s. Is really good. No, that's nice um, right. <laughs> Nobody's going to buy that. Uh, no, it's interesting because a lot of people will just say, you know, so why are you doing this and why are you still doing this? Um, you know, they, they kind of know who you're working with, with teens. And uh, it's interesting, I guess, the way I would sum it up is I was, you know, just heavily involved in my youth group uh, in high school and at the church uh, on the leadership team, just kind of anything that was connected with the church and youth ministry, I did it kept doing it and wanted to make sure it happened. Um, and it was, you know, probably the youth pastor really took a, uh, had a big influence in that, mm-hmm. uh, that he just kind of took me under his wing. I don't know what he saw. Uh, his very interesting story, his very first night uh, of being the youth pastor at this church, uh, I was a freshman and got in trouble. Wasn't good. It was a lock in. I remember mm. him yelling at me and coming over and grabbing me in my sleeping bag because me and this other guy were talking a lot. And he just kind of slid me across the fellowship hall floor until <laughs> I hit the other one. And then I slept really well because I was not. Wow, that wouldn't uh, be allowed oh. in 2020. <laughs> no. That's right. That's and classic. In youth ministry. Classic but from that moment on, he kind of, I don't know if he saw something, but just wanted to spend time. And then uh, 
right before I went to college, one of the guys on the youth staff, uh, it's kind of the end of the year pool party said, oh, have you ever thought about going into youth ministry? And I said, why would I waste my time doing that? Um, I'm going down to college so I can be a math teacher for high schoolers. So even at that point, there was something about high schoolers. Uh, went down to college, got A's in math uh, all during high school. And then my very first test, I got a 27. That was not an answer. That was the, and I said, all right, I don't understand this. This is a little different. So at that point just began, what's, this is not the plan I have. What's going to be going on? Hmm. And then, you know, that whole first semester of college, which you don't really do anything anyway, because it's your first semester of college. Oof. And then came Just put back. on 15 pounds, right? That's all you do. Yeah. Um, go sit out at football games. Um, <laughs> And came back and a guy down the hallway who I maybe I talked to him twice during my fall semester um, said, oh, I told the I told the youth pastor up at uh, First Baptist Church Waco that you're interested in doing youth ministry. And I said, I've never said I was going to do that. Within two days, that youth pastor called me. I went and met with him. February 1980. From then on, it's been no no turning back and just keep kept doing it, which you know, it's probably a very bizarre call because um, it was everyone else calling me. Um, mm. But it was just been doing that ever since, you know, in some form or fashion at four or five different churches now. Yeah. Well, I, I like even how uh, a, a big part of your call included other people affirming and speaking into it. In, and uh, and that a call to anything, let alone ministry, is usually not just yourself thinking I should be doing this, but that God always uses external affirmation from godly men and women to kind of help guide that because sometimes we can't trust our inner um, motives or thoughts. And I think God in, in the Bible and uh, certainly in life today that he uses the combination of internal stirring with an external mm -hmm. calling. And uh, no, it's really great. Absolutely. So give, give the broad strokes of where you served starting in so then. started at first baptist church waco um that was, again i was uh february 1980 so it was second half of my freshman year waco uh, first baptist waco was a 5,000 member church 100 member youth group and they said okay uh work, started working with him and by the end of that uh, term he resigned so they said you're it and i'm like wow. I'm a freshman in college and there's a hundred kids in youth group. Um, but did that, uh, then graduated college, came back home to New Jersey, worked at the uh, church that Mary and I met in, Hedgewood Park Baptist Church down in North Plainfield, New Jersey. Um, worked there a little bit and then got a call out to First Baptist Church Villa Park, Illinois. Um, mm -hmm. Worked there for three years. Uh, knew at that point I needed to get some seminary under my belt. Needed to do something a little beyond just kind of I'm winging it. Um, so I knew there was a brand new seminary opening up back east. Seminary of the East, uh, connected with the Conservative Baptist Association. And it was not going to be your typical seminary. Everything was going to be a little different. You went to class one day. Works for me. But you, <laughs> had to, you had to be on staff at a church. And you had to have mentors that you would meet with weekly to talk about how ministry and what you're learning mesh. And I just loved it. I thought, that's awesome. Um, got a call to Millington Baptist Church, 1987, went there. Um, was there for nine years till 1996. And that, that, that math didn't add up. I was there nine years. Did I say that? Yeah, nine years. Yeah, um, fact check. 96 and then 2020. Here we are. So, yeah. Been in, so that's why when people say, you don't sound like you have a Jersey accent. I'm like, well, I got a little Illinois, a little Texas, and a little Jersey. That <laughs> equals nothing. <laughs> yeah, which is good. <laughs> Usually people don't want the Jersey accent. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So. So it sounds, I'm just curious, did you feel like, I guess, so were you were kind of thrust into the youth ministry thing because you weren't really thinking it would be. And yeah. then, so how did it, how did it grow to be a passion of yours? Cause it seems like, uh, well, I was just thinking about this. You're really passionate about everything that you do, which is an awesome, <laughs> awesome quality. And it's like, it's, it's contagious. So like what makes you so passionate about ministering to teens? Um, now that, you know, you've 
been in it for so long. Yeah. I think one of the things is because everywhere I've been um, or involved in, and I've done, uh, I did about 10 years of uh, substitute teaching in the area. And it feels as though most people either have given up on teens or they're just putting up with teens. Um, and I just, I just have a heart for them because I just think there's so much in them that they have to give. Um, because what I've seen is when they commit to something, they commit a hundred percent and they're very much into it. So I want to make sure that what they're committing to hundred percent is following Christ and, and living a passionate life and being all that they can be in what Christ has made them to be. And that, that probably leads into my, you know, one of my, I guess, top five verses, John 10, 10 where Christ said, I have come that you would have life and, and live it to the full. I want that life for myself, and I want that for everyone that I come in contact with. Um, so especially for teens, I guess I just, I guess that may be it, just to, to really be somebody who's on their side and pulling for them. And when you're talking sixth grade, I guess the, the least common denominator, you may cut this out later, Sixth grade boy, mm -hmm. <laughs> they just don't know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Versus twelfth grade, high school senior or uh, uh, high school male or female. I'm going to this college. I'm majoring this. I already got my job planned, and you know, it's just in those years. I just the transformation is unbelievable. I think every year mm -hmm. we do something with the seniors. I'll say, you know, when these people first started, they were shorter than me. You know, at one point when Aaron was in youth ministry, well, maybe he was never shorter than me. Um, but at some <laughs> point, you know, most people are, and there's just, so it's not just even physical, but just they're spiritually emotional and mental to watch that happen. Because that is, I think, the, the time that they're making the biggest decisions in their lives mm. you know, with typically negative stuff. Um, are they going to start trying stuff and moving out of what probably wouldn't be good for them and, and hopefully kind of moving in the direction where they're going to just stay connected. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's probably fair to say that there's no six year stretch of somebody's life that involves more change physically, emotionally, spiritually than that sixth grade to 12th grade, oh, absolutely. right? 12 years old, 18 years old. And to have um, a church and a ministry and a person at the center of that through the entire six years at the same church now coming on close to 25 years. I think that's been something that's both really special and very rare. Mm. Um, and, and so maybe the, the answer to this question has some overlap to the last one, but um, often there seems to be a portrayal of a ministry arc or career that guys coming out of seminary start in youth ministry because they're younger. That's kind of where they get placed. Mm -hmm. But then, either in their minds or what gets projected on them is that eventually you want to move on past that or it's like a stepping stone to other ministry uh, careers. And, you know, you obviously being in the long haul, not only in youth ministry, but in one church for so long, I, I don't want to make up the stat, but I think it's somewhere around the, the turnover of youth ministry at local churches is like two to three years yeah. on average. So, mm. you know, you're looking at 12 times that just to hear at grace and that, that we're, you know, and that's you know, one of our concerns of, is that we've been spoiled in that sense of having, you know, kind of a mainstay there where most churches are constantly trying to find somebody for that spot in that very crucial stretch of life for mm -hmm. youth in their church. So mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that as to, do you remember a certain point where you're like, you know, what, I, I do want to be in this for the long haul. I'm not looking to quote unquote move on and, you know, pretty admirable in that sense of, of not being like, I don't, I don't want to feel pressured to have to go to something else if this is where my passion is. Do, right. do you recall kind of a, a point where that decision was made or? Yeah. And I would say probably part of that even came from the church I was at previous, you know, being there nine years. Um, I think both, both places when I met with elders to talk about, you know, is this going to be a good fit? Um, somebody on either one of those boards has said, well, you know, basically you have to be here you know, we're guaranteeing to you uh, minimum of four years because you need to have some kind of turnover to see if, if there was a previous youth pastor or something like that. Not that you're weeding them out, but their style of ministry 
the sure. teens that were part of them. And then is your ministry really taking hold? Is it connecting? Is it, is it uh, doing something? Um, and I think that was really part of it. And at both churches, I was also heavily involved in their children's ministry. Mm. Um, you know, either working with like Omega Sports at the, at, uh, at the other church, I was very involved with Pioneer Girls. I know it just sounds weird, but they would always do um, like little musicals or something. And we did Daniel and the Lion's Den. And they, whenever they needed somebody to come play, like Daniel or something, I was always me. So I just oh, we knew all of these, you know, third to sixth grade girls um, who we were doing this show with. And I was like, all right, well, all right, next year, they're going to be up in my ministry. It was like, all right, but ne the next year, other people, you know, so it was just, it almost felt like the ministry started stretching and covering a broader range. And then on the other side of it, having those that were graduating and saying, hey, could I come and like work with you on staff? So on both ends of it. So I was just kind of, it just felt like, right, this is, this is not, this is working. I'm not reading into that, but it just felt like it, but it's working, you know? Yeah. And it's like, why would you want to leave where you're, you're speaking into those before it and you're working with those after it. And just, mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know how you put that in words, but I just use a lot of words. So. <laughs> it's great. I definitely think there's something to, I working with kids too, as an elementary school teacher, there is something that's really amazing about watching the growth through time. So I, I could totally understand you're, 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 you're working with teens. And then as you're there longer seeing the next, I guess you can say generation, you know, of teens come up, you know, mm -hmm. being excited about that and that the, the passion of the kids sort of keeps it rolling. I could see how that, yeah. makes, you know, how that would happen. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a pretty, a lot has changed in the last 40 years. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but for you, like what stands out, um, as like the big changes across youth ministry being, being in the middle of it for the last 40 years? Well, communication has to be the biggest thing, you know? So I started in 1980. Um, so you're like walkie talking everybody like on stage. No, no, we were still right? chiseling in stone and just oh, holding it up. Man. Yeah. Color. Has I read about that. I read about that. No era. Color. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because PCs didn't come out till, you know, 83 cell phones were 85 and the World Wide web 91. So we had none of that. It was simply being with people. And it's interesting because I think one of the things that, that, that I worked with that youth pastor down in Texas for, you know, four or five months, he wanted to always get onto school campuses for lunch with the kids. And back then that was not a big deal. Um, and that just has stuck with me. So e even that just kind of spending time personally with kids, but then when all the communication stuff changed, trying to keep up with that, I'm still not sure that I'm on the latest stuff. Um, but they're all over the place, um, you know, with what they're using for communication and the good and bad of it. Um, so I think that's one of the things that has really changed is just the way you can if we'd had a pandemic back in 1980, it would be, all right, I'll send you a postcard. You know, I'll give you a call. And it just, you know, as opposed to even be able to do something like this, where we're kind of zooming in um, with each other. But I think that's probably the stuff that's changed the most. Otherwise, I think teens are still teens. They're still dealing with the same issues. Um, so, well, I mean, so I would say that they're involved. Stress is heavy on them. There's probably more stress now, maybe because of all the different communication styles and the um, instantaneous ways to know everything, um, which makes it very scary. You know, it, you can use the good side of it. We do have the whole world at our fingertips. We can know anything at any point in time but we know anything at any point in time too. And that just, it, it, there's a constant just anxiety uh, and stress level that I think they're going through. That, that to me is still probably the number one thing uh, mm. that, that age is dealing with and it just continues, you know, much less the time is still the same. Where are they going to give their Sunday mornings or Sunday nights? Because I got sports, I got group projects, I got work, I need to make money. You know, there's so many things vying for their, time as well so those are probably some things that 
really haven't changed, but still affect them. Um, just maybe it's, it's a deeper effect on their life. Yeah. So maybe the inverse of that question would be on the positive side, what, what in 40 years hasn't changed with a team, you know, like you seeing a youth boy or girl coming into your meeting and like, what is your hope for them? What, what, what is like your primary foundational hope for them that regardless if it was 1981 or 2019 or anywhere in between, right. what was just constant that was fueling you and your desire uh, for them? I, I think that probably my, my desire, my hope was that they would get it. And there's enough times where you see it suddenly click. And what I mean by that is kind of, kind of like, they understand who Jesus is. They understand their need to allow him to um, not just be the get out of hell free card, but mm -hmm. to be somebody that they kind of turn their life over to and seek after and follow. And when you get, you see that again, they just kind of get, it. they're sold out. You know, there's still, obviously there's, it's not like, and then, so they stop sinning and you know, that doesn't happen. But I mean, you know, it's just kind of like they understand sin and they, they, there, there's a desire to change it, uh, a desire to be more like Christ. Uh, and that's throughout all of that years. And I think that might play into again, because they're passionate about whatever they're into. You know, you talk yeah. to them about their volleyball team or their basketball team, you know, well, we get together with them every other night just because we're a team. We have to get together. So that mm. I've, I've noticed that the same when they get on. I hope this is not corny. When they get on Christ team and they're sold out to it, they want. I got to bring friends to this, you know. And it's just, it's very cool to see that when it clicks and that they get it. Yeah. One thing that I uh, really appreciated about your ministry when I was in it, and then seeing it throughout the years, then now being in the position of uh, serving and pastoral staff alongside you is that your ability to show interest in what the kids are interested in. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? As opposed yeah. to you being like, this is what you're interested in. And if you want to get along with the youth pastor, then, uh, then you need to kind of jump onto my interests, but you would show that by showing up at their events, whether it was sports or plays or whatever extracurricular, I, th I think you found a way to commit a lot of time in mm -hmm. quote unquote off hours to be there and support that. So, um, why was that important to you to kind of connect with them on that level? Why was that kind of a crucial part of your philosophy of ministry, not just the Sunday night meeting for the hour and a half you have with them? Right. Well, I think probably it plays into just my philosophy of ministry is that I'm, I'm not just here to guide you spiritually, uh, but really the holistic side of it, that um, every, every part of who you are and everything that you're doing is interconnected. Um, and so I take interest in, you know, I will admit, and I'm sorry I'm speaking to a music teacher here, but no, some of those, well, there was junior high when I first started. Now it's called middle school. <laughs> Orchestra concerts. Enough said. No, uh, it's, 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 it's tough. <laughs> it, I mean, those were tough to get through, but it was always fun because, you know, they would be playing whatever they're doing. All of a sudden, they kind of look out there and it was like, okay, it's all the parents. Wait. Pastor Jeff's here. He, what's he doing here? You know, and that's cool. Just kind of saying, Hey, you know, I, I played an instrument too. I did those kind of things too. And the importance of somebody else being there besides, you know, mom and dad, because again, our faith is holistic. It's every part of us. It's, it is you playing that oboe in seventh mm -hmm. grade. It is you playing volleyball as a junior, you know, it's, it's all of that together. Um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons I wanted to just kind of be out there on their turf, uh, even taking them out to lunch. Uh, it's their turf, really. And so I'm not really calling the shots. And just it felt like they were, not that they were stressed when they walked into the annex, but it's kind of like, oh, yeah. So, you know, they kind of just be themselves. And it'd be funny because there would be stuff that would slip out that wouldn't in the annex and they would say oh i'm so sorry i'm like you're being yourself this is what i want i want to see you being yourself whatever that is so it, that was kind of fun just uh, being a part of that as well in their life yeah. and i think we can all think back to like our teenage years to think of you know it's usually teachers you know people who's been or you know that are mentors in your life um but 
to know that somebody stepped into their turf or your turf, you know, when you're a teen, mm -hmm. that just that alone means the world, you know, mm -hmm. especially if they're so passionate about sports or music or whatever it, you know, it doesn't even matter what you say in that moment, but just that you're there. Right. And yeah. that is, that's so cool that you emphasized that practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it, I mean, it's interesting. So it, you know, if it was off hours, do we have hours really? Um, <laughs> you know, but it would, just being there and then coming back and Mary would even, you know, my wife would even notice like, man, you're kind of, you're kind of pumped. I'm like, yeah, I got to spend time with the teen and see them and, and just kind of speak into their life. Yeah. How about um, having three of your own kids come up through the youth ministry program and yeah. that's pretty crazy. Uh, um, and you know, as, as an aside, the the person who's going to be stepping into your shoes with youth ministry uh, at Grace Francis Park has three kids in, in youth mm -hmm. ministry. So right off the bat, he's going to experience that. But what what was that like from a father standpoint and being also their youth pastor and um you obviously had a lot of experience before aj first came in in 2000 2001 i guess is when he started seventh grade he and i were the same grade right um so you had 20 years under your belt but then i assume that that was an interesting wrinkle then for for a while can, can you speak oh, yeah. to that a little bit yeah it's interesting i think there was times that i you know before they kind of came into um I guess middle school, you know, before they just began the whole ministry where it's going to be like, all right, we're going across the parking lot and my dad is still going to be there. Um, I remember sitting down with all three of them at different points and saying, um, I don't have any ex expectations of you. It's like, all right, you don't have to sign up for every mission trip. You don't have to go on every retreat. You don't have to join the youth leadership team. It's not like you know, you have to do this. Uh, I said, I want you to be who you are in this ministry. Uh, and I think from, from my side of it, probably the hardest thing that I've noticed is, you know, as, as a, uh, a youth minister, or even, you know, if you have a teacher who has to do this too, typically it's like, all right, I'm either letting this kid get away with murder because <laughs> they're my kids, so I don't do anything, or I'm holding them to an unattainable goal. It's like, yeah. you have to be a peer. And I tried to, to make sure that they were just who they were, um, you know, as we kind of dealt with things. And it's interesting, I'm trying to think if probably during the ministry, there were probably times in the annex where I kind of took off the youth pastor hat and, and was a dad. But I know at least two times over my house where I took off the dad hat and put on the youth pastor because it's easier having a conversation about a certain topic as a youth pastor as opposed to a dad yeah i'll let people read right. into what that conversation was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i bet well if it's any consolation i mean so aj your oldest who's currently on staff been with us since um 2016 the or 2017 i think the year i became senior pastor he officially joined staff but it was part of the church far before that um one thing that we both talked about and I think we've, we've said to you too, is that both of us growing up pastors, kids, uh, what we appreciate is that that hat, that pastor hat and dad hat were not that much different, mm -hmm. if, if different at all, that the consistency of, you know, mm -hmm. from AJ's perspective, the dad who was there on Saturdays, you know, with him teaching him things, just being a dad. And then the dad who was teaching on Sunday night as mm -hmm. a pastor, that there was not this huge gap between the two. And, and, from my perception, that's where I think a lot of things do go awry in pastors' families, especially with pastors' kids, is when they see this huge gap between dad on the job and dad at home. Yeah. And um, to, to not, and I think evidence of us both being in ministry and on staff is, and we want to then model that for our children and you know, yeah, the, our spouses too, that, um, that we're not two different people when we're on, quote unquote on and off. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that's, uh, that's a huge, um, just positive as, as you reflect mm -hmm. on that. I hope you can reflect upon on your, your 40 years. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, it's interesting. As I'm thinking another thing, um, we would often have, you know, I guess that whole, uh, pastor, uh, youth pastor, dad hat that went on and off is also just, are you, are we living life honestly mm -hmm. in front of them? 
um, so that they're not seeing that hypocrisy. And I remember one of the times there was, I think somebody on the student leadership team, um, cause we'd have them over every week for meetings and meals and stuff like that. And one of them said, you know what I really love about seeing you and Mary is that you fight. And I remember kind of going, okay, that's a really weird thing. And I, and I kind mm -hmm. of said, well, can you explain that? I said, well, I see my parents will have a fight, but then they kind of go away and they come back and it's all done. Whereas with you, we're seeing you guys actually work through the process in front of us. So we're seeing, you know, what we don't see at home, the modeling of, yeah, you still fight, you still have arguments, but how do you get through that? Um, so that was, I think, probably just that, that being honest, you know, that the, what you see where, with, whatever building I'm in, I'm still me. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to let, uh, we have a next question on our, on our list. I'm going to let you do that one because you're the one in the early stages of your ministry talking to the guy about to retire. So we'll yeah. kick well, that one over to you. Yeah. And, and this is really just letting everybody else in on it. Cause I've talked to Jeff about with this about a dozen times over the last few years, probably. And cause a lot of our staff is young and new to ministry and, if you were to look up the statistics of those who remain in ministry, it's not very encouraging. You know, I, I again, I want to. Are our stats ever very encouraging? No, no that's no. true. If, if, it's, if it's worth saying, it's probably something negative. Um, <laughs> but I, at one point, I think I read definitely the majority, maybe even eight out of 10, I don't know if it was pastors or just people in ministry, are not still in ministry mm -hmm. 10 years after joining. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons that could go into that. Um, but with our having a pretty young staff, myself included, I've only now been in ministry five years. Uh, I've, I've always kind of picked Jeff's brain as to what were some keys to just long-term faithful ministry and in one place, you know, tw you know, long time ministry is one thing, but staying in one place and not bouncing around someplace every two to three years, um, something to be said for that. So uh, not that there's a formula, not that there's a, you know, silver bullet here, but what are a couple of things that you would just say were, keys to you being able to persevere through like any ministry career tough times and mm -hmm. you know just persevering in one place in ministry what would you speak to that on yeah probably i guess um a couple of things come to my mind is <laughs> really tough skin <laughs> but having a very soft heart in the midst of that you know just kind of going all right did did whatever just happened was that aimed at me mm. or are they dealing with something? And I just happened to be the closest person that it bounced off of. So that's the tough skin part, not taking everything personally. And the soft heart part is um, just kind of desiring a change in them. Um, I think everyone, whether you're in ministry or a teacher or wherever you are, if you have others that you're in charge of, um, there's probably – a kid or two that, you know, it could be a Sunday night and they walk and like, Oh, they showed up, you know, <laughs> Oh, it's going to be one of those nights. And, and almost, and, and let me finish through everything I want to say almost as though the enemy has arrived, you know, and now it's going to be a tough night. And I remember being reading an article in one of the, the youth magazines that said, you know, we all have that kid or two kids that we just view as the enemy and they're just out to get us. And they said, but you need to really understand is that they are actually a victim of the enemy. And the enemy is using them to distract you, to disrupt what's going on. So don't allow that kid, that teen to be the enemy. But, you know, again, with the tough skin and the soft heart, and praying for them to be able to, to kind of come to the other, and the, the number of kids that, you know, and you, as you do that, pray for them and really see them in a different light, the change that happens. Um, and again, that, that to me is probably the whole part of the, the longevity is change will happen. It's, it, it will come. <laughs> um, it, eventually, you know, it, whether it's going to be in the, before they graduate or, you know, a number of kids that after they've gone off to college and they've come back and said, you know, I'm, you probably didn't think I really cared what you said. And, you know, kind of was forced to come. But I do remember you, 
either being there, you know, coming to one of my games or, or taking me out to lunch or getting a cup of coffee. And uh, they saw my, you know, the heart and they said, so thanks for putting up with me because <laughs> uh, mm. it's paying off now. Not, not that they're coming to, to, to uh, pour everything out on me as doing that, but just kind of, I was one of those influences in their life. Um, so I think that's, that's, those are probably a couple of the biggest things is we're going to have people that are not going to like what we do, but to not take it personally all the time. I mean, unless we have, you know, a horrible character flaw that needs to be changed, then change it. But yeah. uh, to just really understand that there is a greater enemy who is seeking to pull us apart and make us view each other poorly. Um, and just to, to, to pray the Holy Spirit kind of helps us to see through that to their heart. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm taking over all these questions, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going off, off the, uh, off the, <laughs> no, uh, I'm just absorbing. That was, that was so, that yeah. was so inspiring. So you just got, I don't, I would completely distracted. I'm like, what comes yeah. next? I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> Who knows? It's, it's a good thing about podcasts. You just kind of keep throwing questions on. That's right. One that's related. And I know we, I've talked this about you before, but the witness of your marriage and of a strong, close relationship with your wife after 40 years of ministry. I, I mean, in today's day, that's unfortunate. That's probably not the norm. And, and mm-hmm. so what, um, maybe this is overgeneralized question, but what, what's the value of a wife who's really supportive of you in ministry? And, and what has your relationship with Mary done to kind of help answer that question before, of like persevering you know, right. over the long haul? Well, Mary actually does everything, and then I just I memorize it, and because I'm a people person, I get to be out front <laughs> no, some, and just do it. <laughs> some that, people might believe that. Now yeah, we got yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's there probably true for all three of us, right? I mean, it's just yeah. kind of like, all right, there's somebody who's saying, "Go do this." Yes, ma'am, and you do it, yeah. and we get the credit. Yes, there is um, a large percentage to that. There is. But I do think that's a huge part of it to understand. It's not me doing this, and. You just stay home and, and do that. But we really are a team working in this direction because there are going to be other people who kind of drop in on us unexpected um, or that may rub her or me the wrong way. And so we need to be able to kind of lean into each other and to kind of say, you know, either what we're feeling and then they're giving the pers- perspective going, oh, I didn't see that at all. Oh, good. What did you see? You know, and kind of talk us down or lift us up, you know, for feeling poorly. It's like, you know, but they can always share something they saw as well. Um, but there is a lot of kind of just seeking advice um, from a spouse uh, because they, no one knows, well, Christ knows us better, but no one knows us better than that person. Uh, mm-hmm. They've seen us at our worst. And so they kind of know, uh, what we can offer and how to best offer it. And um, God has created that union for a particular reason, you know, that even Mary and myself, we both have strengths and weaknesses that we both cover in each other. And that's not just in the marriage, but that becomes all of life and raising our kids in ministry, uh, in her ministry areas, me coming alongside and kind of going, oh, what about this? just because I view it differently. So it's really mm-hmm. kind of saying, how are we approaching life as a team? Um, and then allowing each other to speak to that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so going back to for kind of closing out with our final questions here um, for, as we look to the uh, present and future of youth ministry, in particular, uh, what do you think is, I know you spoke on uh, communication before, what do you think is the greatest challenge of youth ministry today? Time. Uh-huh. Everyone is battling for those kids' time. Whether it's, you know, and you're hearing it now from, not now, I mean, now you're hearing from parents going, oh, it's so nice having our kids home. We're actually all eating meals together. You know, yep. whereas previous you couldn't, and they're like, oh, this is, this is what we've missed. But parents are, are wanting their kids. Um, teachers are saying, all right, you need to make sure you're doing this, and it's going to be, you know, a three-hour project you have to do. Their sports teams are calling for their time. Most of the kids have one or two jobs that's calling for their time. So how do you – so time is, is of the essence of them. So 
Um, I, I, back in the, I want to say late eighties, early nineties, it was, so to get their time, you gotta be flashy. You know, you just got to do the, the stuff that will draw them out. Um, and I think that worked until they said, but that's not you, mm. you know? So I think for them, the, the thing that will draw their time is if they're seeing, um, a person who says they're going, they, they are who they're going to be and they really show a care and concern for them. So I think time is probably, um, the hardest thing to, that is that we're battling right now with them. Um, and then another thing is, I think their dedication to any one thing because of FOMO, the fear of missing out on something that could be even better. Um, it's interesting, and as I think about that, there's a couple other, and, and, and actually your dad and I always had this discussion. It's either an acronym or an acrostic, mm. but it's the letters mean something else. So we went <laughs> back and forth, like we don't know what it is. But we all know FOMO is your fear of missing out of something that could be better. Um, and what I've noticed since then is really, I think with the, with Snapchat, with Instagram, with TikTok, those things, what's, what they're battling now is uh, fear of looking bad. That they're going to, you know, they only are going to post things that show them in a good light. So they're always constantly battling that. It's like, all right, I just need to make sure that you're only seeing the best part of, of me. Um, and then one that really, I actually have noticed probably maybe the last five, seven years is the fear of messing up. And they really mm -hmm. won't dedicate unless they know that they're going to ace whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to make sure that whatever I'm going to do, I can really do it well. Cause I don't want to get up there and mess up. And I think that's, Whereas if you're a youth pastor, your life is about messing up because you're going to try everything because you have all these kids. So you just have to learn how to be a fool for Christ. Um, somebody wrote a really good book about that. Uh, but I think that those are some of the things, um, their dedication is th there's always something that may be, which I think can actually connects back into time. There's something that could be more, um, will take their time if it's a little more exciting. So those are, th it's just, but that's been since 80. That's probably back when I was in high school. Yeah. Back in the 18, 1835, you know, that, <laughs> those times were very different, but that's still it. it. Teens are always like, all right, what, what gives me an instant gratification? That's where I want to go. Where do I feel good about myself? And so we're, you're constantly battling those. I think those two things. Yeah. Maybe a, a related question would be uh, for parents who have either kids or currently youth or like Steve and I were, we think we're years and years away, but it's going to come before we know it of coming right. into those kind of middle school years and how daunting it is for parents, especially once their first, you know, son or daughter gets into that age range of how am I going to keep them? How do I keep the world from overtaking them? You know, I can't put them in a bubble, but, I've, you know, or, or, you know, maybe panicking is too strong of a word, but really anxious over how do I parent a middle schooler or high schooler? Mm -hmm. um, again, there's no formula. Every kid is different, but what, what's, if, if you had just a parent sitting in front of you, what, what's one or two things you'd say to them just to encourage them in their discipleship of their kids? I, probably I, the first thing I would do is advise them of the two extremes. Um, and there's new phrases that are coming out, but one is don't be a, and now that we're in the summer, we can say a lawnmower parent who goes in front of their kid and just knocks down every single obstacle. So now my kid's going to have life. It's going to be so easy. In the mm. winter, you would call it a snow, a snow plow. You know, no. you're just, I'm making sure there's nothing in front of you. So I will take care of life for you. Um, I think previously, you know, they call it helicopter parents, stuff like that, but that really is. And I've seen that where, um, if I'm dealing with a kid about something, you know, I, I, I go to a kid and say, I need you to fill out this form. The next day, the parent has filled it out and gives it to me. You know, I'm like, but the, it's not just that I needed the information. I needed them to kind of take the initiative. So advising, don't be a lawnmower parent, but also don't be a dry cleaning parent. Um, where you're going to be sixth grade, dropping them off at church. I will be back when they're 12th grade and make sure it's iron starched and on a hanger. And I want my kids perfect on the other side. Um, we, we have talked about this so many times, you know, 
the scripture calls us in Deuteronomy 6 that all of this should be taking place in the home. You know, when you stand, when you rise up, when you're lying down, you're always talking about the goodness of the Lord. You're talking about his precepts, the scripture with them. Uh, and the church really, you know, I just am I'm coming alongside to encourage and help. So those would probably be some, some kind of precursor things. But my main thing to probably every parent is wait it out. Mm. It's going to get better. Wait it out. And then if they, if they have to question, it, I'll say, remember when you were a teen? Mm. That's pretty much all I was oh, like, oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, be patient. And like, and, yeah, and look how you turned out, you know. Yeah. Um, and and I, that and then also let them be a teen. Mm. Let them enjoy the, the time that they're in. I think a lot of times parents and probably myself as well, I want them to be an adult. Just like don't have any issues here. Just you know what to do. And I'm like, wait, you're still a, you're a teenager. You're not, your brain, everything is not fully developed. So, and all the neurons and all that stuff, I don't know all the scientific stuff are not fully developed. So I can't expect you to know all of this stuff, you know, with age comes wisdom. I missed out on that, but with age <laughs> comes wisdom, um, you know, because you're finally learning and experiencing stuff and, and knowing what you should and shouldn't do. So, you know, just wait it out because your, your kids are going to turn out. All right. Um, Proverbs, you know, Solomon said that raise mm. up a child, uh, train up a child in the way she go and he will not depart from it. Mm. Uh, so just wait it out and keep praying for him. Yeah. Sorry. Another off the grid question coming. Um, I, I'm sure this is a very emotional time for you coming, you know, down the home stretch of a 40 year ministry career and retiring what that next step looks like for you. Um, if you, and it's not just ministry, but for you, I imagine it's names and faces over 40 years that I'm sure you can yeah. still remember at varying degrees. Uh, if, if you had some, either anybody who's been through youth ministry in the past or somebody who's currently in youth ministry and you just had two minutes with them of like, here, here's the one thing I just want you to know. And maybe mm -hmm. it's related to the passage that you'll be preaching on this weekend that by the time people hear it, no, I've already, uh, here's this podcast, I've already heard the sermon on Ephesians yeah. 3, but what, what, what's that just, I got two minutes with you. What, what, what's one thing you just want to put into the teens, into their minds and hearts? I, I think one of the things is um, John 10, 10, again, I just, I, every, like every time I'm teaching at some point, I, I go back to John 10, 10. I don't know, my, my closing prayer almost every single youth group is, that we would live life to the full and know that we can't do it on our own. So mm. live life to the full. And whatever that means, that's typically where I will say, so live it with passion. Just be passionate about it. Don't be just this wallflower that allows life to go by you, but be passionate about it. Live life to the full and understand though we never can fully the height, breadth, length and depth of the love of Christ. It's, you know, it, it's more than we can, well, he even says it at the end of that, you know, he's able to do more than we ask or imagine. And that is even more than we can ask or imagine. And just to just kind of dip your toe into that and really experience that love because it costs his son his life so that you can spend it with him. So, you know, go for it. He has more interest in us and has our uh, intentions more at heart than we do about ourselves we give up on ourselves more than he does you know yes. and i think it's because of his love so just live life to the full be passionate and and dip your toe into the love of christ just experience that it's great that's awesome um so Aaron, can I go to the next question here? Like, as a, permission, I permission kind of granted. Good. Permission <laughs> good. good. No, because this is this is fantastic. Um, so you, Jeff, personally, um, what are your plans going forward next? Um, so you're. This is the first time you'll be not in a ministry position in forty years. It's not like you're retiring to go maybe do. Well, maybe you will do more ministry. That's totally up to you. But I just was curious. Like, what are your plans moving forward? I'm taking over this podcast. Uh, no, uh, so <laughs> over my dead body. <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting. I, uh, the number of people that I have spoken to or heard from is said, you know, 
I guess because they know me, it's kind of like, you don't need to have a title to be a minister. Right. You're going to, I'm going to, yeah, I'm not, it's July 1st. I don't suddenly stop caring about people. Um, that would just, I don't even, can't even think what that would be like. Uh, it's just, it's going to have a different look to it. You know, uh, even some of the things that I'm kind of looking at um, for the future to, you know, help with income involve people and building relationships. It's like, okay, didn't you just do that for 40 years, if not longer? So it really is just kind of, you know, we're planning to stay in the area. Um, hopefully, hopefully having an opportunity where we can say goodbye to everyone with, you know, where we can hug it out. It's just, it's this is such a weird time to retire. It feels more like, you know, kind of fading into the distance. Um, but, you know, knowing, knowing that'll be there at some point where we can, you know, officially say goodbye and hug and, and see people face to face. And, you know, again, some of those things are, it's still going to be involving people. Um, I'm not going to be a telemarketer somewhere, you know, bugging people. It'll be hands-on face to face, whether I'm substitute teaching or if I'm driving and building a relationship with different people that, you know, uh, are in the car with me or whatever, but that's kind of, it's just going to look a little different. Yeah. I'll still be, it'll still be about people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know, I feel like we've had this conversation several times over the years too, that you don't really believe in retirement in, in, in the sense that I think our country usually portrays it uh, right. you know, because uh, there's no retirement in the Bible. And I, I really get to the spirit of what you're saying that there's a difference between vocational retirement, which you're doing for ministry, but it doesn't mean you're retiring from life. And I know you and Mary are both excited about this next chapter, you know, even with some of the unknown of some of the opportunities that are going to come your way that you might know now, but might not know in other ways. And mm -hmm. you'll have the freedom to pursue them as they come. Right. And uh, I'm excited for you guys. I know your kids are excited for you guys in that thing of having a, mm -hmm. the freedom in the sense of just do what you guys want to pursue and do and let right. those passions continue to flame. But, but you're not done by any means that, you know, by, right. um, by God's grace, we hope you have a long, you know, long road ahead still. That, yeah. that really yeah. is going to be um, a fruitful chapter for you. And um, just reflecting on 40 years of ministry, I just want in this podcast just to celebrate that. And um, and we focused primarily on youth ministry here because I know that's been a heartbeat, you know. Um, but me personally, knowing over the last five years, it was way more than just youth ministry for you at Grace that um, you're the definition of a guy that wears many hats and does a lot behind the scenes that most people aren't aware of and just the operations of a church. And for a young staff and a young pastor like me coming in was invaluable having you kind of a, kind of an anchor in a lot of ways um, for us here as we've seen what God's been doing here at Grace in the last few years. And so, um, but at the same time, just there, there's a time to celebrate um, people and how the way God's used them and to give mm -hmm. glory to God for how he uses men and women. And I think, yeah. um, just really appreciate your and Mary's ministry here at Grace. Um, and me seeing all the different sides of it from being under it. Uh, my brother's going through it and then pastoring alongside you through it. It's, um, you know, it's no joke and there, there's a lot of good, but there's a lot of hard too. And, um, again, I just, maybe I'll end with just the, Acknowledging the perseverance of long-term faithful ministry is something mm -hmm. that I think I hope the members of Grace can really appreciate and see and, and celebrate as well. And, and like you said, that we'll have an opportunity to uh, to do that in a better way than in squares on a screen. But yes. uh, yeah. I trust, I trust that time is coming. Mm -hmm. So good stuff. Good, good. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jeff, for coming on the podcast. And we just want to thank you always for bringing your passion and your thoughtfulness and support to all of us. And um, we just appreciate it. So thanks so much. Absolutely. My pleasure.